Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Meanwhile, Leave campaigners are looking to distance themselves from their suggestion that £350 million a week, saved from contributions to the European Union, could be spent on the NHS instead. The £350 million a week we send to the EU, which we will no longer send to the EU, can you guarantee that's going to go to the NHS? No, I can't, and I, and I would never have made that claim. There we go. Let's give our NHS the yep. £350 million the EU takes every yep. week. That's pretty explicit. No ifs, no buts. That's what we're going to do. 17 million people have voted for leave. Yep. Based, I don't know how many people voted on the basis of that advert, but that was a huge part of the propaganda. You're now saying that's a mistake. And that is a promise broken. No, it's not a promise broken. I never said that during the course of the election. What I said was we would be able to spend no, the no, lion's share... On the side of the bus yeah, here, from WNYC in New York, this is On the Media. I'm Bob Garfield. And I'm Brooke Gladstone. We're gathered here today to celebrate a time-honored tradition. Well, maybe not celebrate. And maybe not honored. But certainly timely, the political lie. You know, the police say that didn't happen at all. Those rumors have been on the Internet for some time. So did you meek, misspeak it did yesterday? Happen. I saw it. it you was saw television. that with your I own eyes? It. ABC's George Stephanopoulos last December questioning Donald Trump on one of his most dubious claims. George, it did say happen. It didn't there happen. were people that were cheering in the other side of New Jersey where you have large Arab populations. They were cheering as the World Trade Center came down. Ah, the political lie. Not new, but somehow more prominent during this election season than ever before. Perhaps because one of the chief falsifiers is so unabashedly unrepentant, much to the frustration of those with the job of challenging him. NBC's Chuck Todd. Hey, Mr. Star. Trump, if I said, well, people have said Mr. Trump's not worth $10 billion, you would say that was crazy. You're this running for president of Chuck. the United this States. Your words matter. This Truthfulness matters. Fact-based stuff Chuck, matters. Chuck, no? Make it easy, Chuck. Just play cool. Back in December, when we first aired this show, the nation was embarking on the primary election season that would end in Donald Trump being named the presumptive Republican nominee. Back then, the pundits didn't think he stood much of a chance, in part because of the abundance of his lies. But he triumphed, and the lies have continued. Just this week, Trump scored a pants on fire from PolitiFact when he said, I think it's about Hillary in terms of religion. Now, she's been in the public eye for years and years, and yet there's no, there's nothing out there. Actually, PolitiFact listed many, many citations of Clinton speaking of her Methodist faith on the trail and throughout her career. But Trump was only the most flamboyant of this year's crop of fabricators. So as we head into the next phase of this lengthy election season, we offer a reprise of our show, all about lies. We begin with a taxonomy of the political lie. Let's start with lies of omission, withholding key facts or context that renders the claim untrue. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. The president made a promise he knew would be impossible to keep. Obamacare did allow for the continuation of current health plans, but only if they complied with strict rules, and many couldn't. And then there are lies of distortion. Well, if you really look, Sarah, at the economy, it's been terrible. We have 93 million people out of work. They look for jobs, they give up, and all of a sudden, statistically, they're considered employed. Can it be? 93 million people don't work? Yep, but that includes nearly 38 million people of retirement age, 10 million stay-at-home moms, roughly 6 million students, 9 million on disability. In other words, a lie. And there are lies of exaggeration. Meanwhile, we end up spending almost twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. We do spend more per capita, but not twice as much. Then there are those adorable lies of personal biography. I was offered a full scholarship to West Point, got to meet General Westmoreland, go to Congressional Medal, our dinners. 
uh, but decide really my pathway would be medicine. And what could be trouble on this front? Carson's campaign admitting just moments ago that his story about getting accepted into and receiving a full scholarship to West Point was inaccurate. He never even actually applied. Mm. He has never been, it, that has been a central point of Carson's inspirational personal story for years. That's so wrong, it's hilarious. But everybody does it. There are lies of invention, you know, when candidates appear to go into a fugue state. And make higher education faster and easier to access, especially vocational training. For the life of me, I don't know why we have stigmatized vocational education. Welders make more money than philosophers. We need more welders and less philosophers. There is a real argument about more vocational training and a focus on that. But on this claim in particular, this is what we found. Turns out philosophers make more money than welders. That's right. The median salary for philosophy professors is 63, almost $64,000. The median salary for welders is about thirty-seven four. If you look just at philosophy majors, the gap gets even bigger. Just philosophy majors make more than philosophy professors. So the final there, uh, false, actually. Marco Rubio is wrong. And of course, the bald-faced lie. Very popular this season. This agreement trusts the Iranians to inspect themselves. But I also understand that Obamacare isn't helping anyone. Every time we raise the minimum wage, the number of jobless people increases. The federal government right now does not deport criminals. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate. And every season. I remember landing under sniper fire. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And though I'm sure you could slice and dice these categories ever finer, I'll end with the lie that has its basis in the feeling that it must be true, even when all the evidence shrieks otherwise, that's clung to even as it molders in its grave. Like the lie about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Or this immortal formulation from Ronald Reagan. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. There are the lies that spill from the mouths of politicians and the lies we tell ourselves and each other every day. Maria Hartwig, a social psychologist at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, who focuses on lying, says there's a notable challenge in trying to calculate how often people lie because, well, you know. Given the moral status of lying, if you ask people the question, they might lie in response. <laughs> Nevertheless, the studies that we have on lying shows that everybody lies and people tend to lie at least a couple of times a day. Now, there are lies and there are lies. There is, I never had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And then there is, oh, what a beautiful baby. I suspect that many lies that are told on the fly in social life, we don't even stop to register that they're lies. And the lie told to a friend in that instance is in all likelihood told to spare them from any negative feelings. We tell them because we care about them. Now, there's a, yet another category that I think is not unique to politicians, but it's very much in their province, and that is saying things not so much to deceive as to just seduce an audience. Uh, there's a, a term of art for this. There is. And that is? It's bullshit. This is a term from the philosopher Harry Frankfurt. He pointed out that when telling a lie, you know what the truth is, and you're deliberately trying to cover it up. In contrast, when people produce bullshit speech, they have little or no interest in what the actual facts are. The motivation lies elsewhere. It's because you want to win. Whether this is a correct representation of reality or not is secondary. And we've had a, a very trenchant example of that recently. It's entirely possible that Donald Trump wasn't lying when he said this. Hey. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. 
thousands of people were cheering. You know, the police say that didn't happen at all. Those rumors have been on the Internet for some time. There were no contemporaneous police reports or complaints from citizens. Uh, the journalism did not bear this description out in any way, shape, or form. And yet, that's his story, and he's sticking with it, not necessarily because he's lying, simply misremembering, which I guess is what makes eyewitnesses, some of whose testimony can send someone else to the death chamber, not necessarily reliable. Right. So whenever you face a statement that clearly deviates from the facts that you have, you have to make one of three judgments, and they're very difficult to make, if not impossible. One is that the person is simply misremembering. The second is that the person is lying, that they know that this didn't happen. And the third is that they simply don't care. And that would put them in the Frankfurt's bullshit category. We've established that everyone's a liar, that nobody wants to be branded a liar, that people yet confess to being a liar, at least when it comes to social lies. And yet another that we demand in politicians a level of truthfulness that we don't exhibit in our own lives. And then still again, that we have a tendency to believe what they say, even though we also believe that all politicians lie. You're right that there are many paradoxes in how we think about lies. If I'm telling a lie to you, I can justify it because of reasons X, Y, Z. And it doesn't necessarily in my own self-image make me a bad person. But if you're lying to me, or I imagine that you are, it reflects negatively on your character. There is a classic study conducted in the 1960s where people were asked to evaluate a whole bunch of different adjectives that describe ways in which you can be abrasive, forthcoming, 555 different labels that you can place onto people. The worst thing, it seems, that you can be is a liar. Yet the people who filled out that questionnaire in all likelihood told at least one lie during that day. Now, politicians, of course, face a very difficult task because circumstances that are involved in being a politician invite dishonest speech more so than ordinary life. They have to produce a lot of speech, which increases the probability that you will tell a lie. And there's such a strong motivation to say things that you think that people want to hear. My suspicion is that it's not really the case that a certain type of people is attracted to this role of a politician where you get to fib and manipulate endlessly. I think it's a that they, as a practical matter, have to fib because there is a penalty, often, for being caught in a truth. Yes. They might have come to the conclusion that it would be more damaging to actually be honest. Which is the final paradox. Is it not that while we claim to demand and expect truth from our candidates, we actually turn out not to like candor any more than we like that brutally honest person in our family or our workplace who just gives you their unvarnished thoughts, come what may. I think people have a very conflicted relationship with getting the truth. I think they want the truth if it fits with what they want to hear. What would Jack Nicholson say? Well, that they can't handle it. And I think that's probably right. In many instances, they wouldn't necessarily want to live in a world where honesty was universal. Maria, thank you very much. Thank you. Maria Hartwig is a professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, where her specialty is lying. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Political lies have a rich history. Take, for instance, the sinking of the USS Maine off the coast of Havana in 1898. Two days after the sinking, the New York Journal declared that the Maine had been brought down by a Spanish torpedo, helping to launch the Spanish-American War. But there was no Spanish torpedo, just a U.S. publisher, William Randolph Hearst, who wanted a war and plenty of politicians who felt the same way. Or we could look at President Johnson and the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident when the president claimed the U.S. military had been attacked twice by the North Vietnamese. The media repeated the claim, and Congress authorized Johnson to use military force in Vietnam. But 
Johnson later admitted to an aide that there probably had been no second attack, and for all he knew, the U.S. sailors may have just been shooting at flying fish. The war lasted another 10 years. Rick Perlstein is a writer for The Washington Spectator. He says that though the lies never cease, the kind of lies politicians tell and get away with has shifted over the last half century, beginning in the waning years of the Vietnam War with a moment of optimism. There was this brief period in the 1970s in which truth became fashionable in American politics. You know, you had Senate hearings on the deceptions of the CIA. You had, of course, the Watergate hearings. You had a strong sense that the job of the media was to call powerful institutions to account. And one of the things that ended it was Ronald Reagan saying America was still a city on the hill, that we're God's chosen nation, and that all these Debbie Downers in the media didn't need to be listened to. They say that the United States has had its day in the sun, that our nation has passed its zenith. My fellow citizens, I utterly reject that view. That was inherited by a generation of conservatives who really believed that they were fighting for civilizational stakes. And a kind of ends justifies the means logic entered the Republican Party. When you discuss the press and its relationship to the political lie, mm -hmm. something happened somewhere in, let's just say, the 90s when the press stopped calling out lies for what they were. There was a shift when the conservative movement began taking over the Republican Party in the wake of Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. Agnew famously used the press as a political tool and tried to describe them as a kind of sinister other. The pampered prodigies of the radical liberals in the United States Senate have hatched their little chicks and now they're coming home to roost. And that brings me to my target for tonight. <laughs> the professional pessimist. In the United States today, we have more than our share of the nattering nabobs of negativism. He was degrading their authority as referees. He said that they had a dog in the fight, you know, that they were these unelected aristocrats telling Americans what to think. They weren't these kind of gods 30,000 feet up on Mount Olympus proclaiming the truth like, you know, someone like Walter Cronkite had done when he went to Vietnam and said, you know, we're losing this war. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe in the face of the evidence the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. Once the press came to believe that their job was uh, not to say this is a lie and this is the truth, but we have to be balanced between two ideological factions, that structurally advantaged the side that was more willing to lie. And it really became a perfect closed system because if the press did intervene, if it left its false equivalency, false uh, objectivity, then they're biased. Then they're biased. And aha, everyone from Sarah Palin back to Spiro Agnew were right all along. And I've had the experience of calling out a lie by a Republican activist on, uh, if you'll forgive me, a public radio show and having the host, you know, jump down my throat for using the L word. In fact, we happen to have oh, goodness. a little bit of the tape with you and anti-tax firebrand Grover Norquist on The Diane Rehm Show. Roll the tape. Uh, no, I'm not for abolishing Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. I'm for making them fully funded. Right. Would you of like... Of course, Grover Norquist wants to get rid of Social Security and Medicare. No, I don't. Don't work. tell me my position, he, sir. I've you're, written a book on the you're subject. You're a Leninist. Oh. Rick, no. hold on. Grover Norquist. He's lying. How would... Uh, please don't use such words on this program. All right, Rick, that wasn't necessarily a triumph of civility, but why? Why was she offended? What was it about calling Grover Norquist a liar just based on the facts, something that she wasn't willing to listen to? I, I, got, I got one thing wrong. Grover Norquist actually held up Stalin as his hero because he said Stalin controlled the personnel and Trotsky controlled the army. But the fact of the matter is 
I broke the rules of the game. The rules of the game say that both sides in a partisan dispute are supposed to be adjudicated, quote unquote, objectively. And if objective truth is traduced in the process, so be it. With Trump, something new is going on. Nothing that comes out of his mouth is true, including the words and and the. Right. Dave Roberts of Vox get a wonderful piece that really kind of got to the bottom of this. You've always kind of been allowed to lie on policy, whether it was, you know, George Bush saying his tax cuts would go to the bottom half of the income distribution or the stuff involving Iraq or the stuff uh, Mitt Romney was saying about what his economic policies would do or Jeb Bush deciding that he could create a certain level of economic growth basically just by saying so. And the press doesn't like to adjudicate policy. But the other thing is quantitative. Dave Roberts points out that you're kind of allowed nine lies, and as long as you kind of retract the tenth one once the media calls you out, everything's kosher. Donald Trump won't have any of that. We're in new territory now. What does it mean for future elections and future populistic demagogues? Well, of course, it's entirely frightening. But I think the silver lining, the redemptive movement in this can come on the side of the media. If they just basically stop worrying what politicians think about them, if they call out a lie and uh, a politician squeals like a pig that they're biased, just act like a grown-up and keep on calling out the lies. Just do it. Well, Rick, thank you so much. Bob, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Rick Perlstein is a writer for The Washington Spectator. Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. 